Jesus, every knee shall bow, every knee shall bow, at the mention of his name, at the name of Jesus, every tongue shall confess. A sacrifice. Listen, he came that we might live. Oh, Jesus, the name that is above all other names, highly exalted. He reigns on high, evermore. At the name of Jesus. It's so exciting to be here and it's Reg coming at you from the Woody Point studio of Clontarf Beach Baptist Church and rocking together with me is DJ P who is doing a fantastic job. She's cleaned her teeth, got her best clothes on, uh, just ready for today and so am I excited about uh, celebrating who Jesus is this morning. What I'd like to do is pray. Uh, just so that, uh, well, I don't know if I need to pray for DJP, but uh, pray that everything just works and that the Lord blesses us this morning. Let's have a quick word of prayer. Lord, we thank you for this morning, for the opportunity we have to gather in this strange way. And we ask that despite the strangeness, that you will still work in and through this time that we share together. Lord, we ask this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Well, the uh, Atkinson family has done some more worship songs with us, for us today, so we're going to uh, join in with them and worship the Lord together. Take it away, Janelle. Good morning, Clontarf Beach Baptist Church. Yet again, here we are. Um, my name's Janelle. This is my husband, Marcus, and our son, David. And Genevieve is behind the camera and she's been doing a great job for us. Um, we, um, 
we're in the thick of it now with homeschooling at home. I'm very grateful that they're both in high school. I hear from friends that having primary school students is a tough gig. So a big shout out to you mums and dads out there who are doing the hard yards with that. Um, this, this new way of life, being home all the time and not using fuel and, you know, there's a lot that's different. There's a lot where we've all had to just reset what we do, how we do things, the way we think, new routines. Um, it's been really interesting. There's a lot of good as well, a lot of positives, and, um, and we're trying to focus on those. And I just want to, um, this morning's service is about Jesus. And the, one of my favourite things about having a close relationship with the Lord is that the old has gone and the new has come. And that there's a verse that specifically talks about that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 17. And it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. And so that's, that's what happens when you give your heart to the Lord Jesus. The old life has gone and the new has come. So um, I'm sure you're all at home wanting to stand and worship God with us. So we hope that you're going to do that now with us as we sing um, a couple of worship songs. First one is Jesus, we love you.
adore and how great you are O oh Lord my God when I in awesome wonder consider all the works thy hands have made sorry hon okay right.
are. For you are King of kings and Lord of lords. It is not about us, Lord, but it's all about you. It's all about Jesus. Amen. Well, thanks to the Atkinson family. That was, uh, that was fantastic. And thanks to DJP, who's rocking those words for us. It is a real privilege. Ooh, just got a cramp. Okay, uh, I have a couple of announcements. If you follow us on the Facebook page, you'll find that uh, there is a youth video that's good. Well, I don't know if it's a blessing, but it's certainly funny. Uh, you should watch that. That's uh, good to fill away hours. Just put it on repeat and laugh yourself to death. Then there is uh, Pastor Bruce has done a kids club slash kids church video uh, that also is really funny. Uh, and I think Bruce has put on his complete Colin Buchanan persona and has pulled off a doozy there. So make sure you get a handle on looking at these videos on Facebook. And while we're all stuck at home, uh, you shouldn't just sit there. You should make sure that you call someone, call people, make sure your friends are feeling like they belong and connected. Uh, we're trying to call people. And so every, if everyone does it, uh, everyone should be okay. It was a bit strange doing Anzac Day yesterday. We, we had a bit of a trouble. We we connected up to the uh, RSL Queensland website and they had this uh, countdown timer to 6am and at 6am they'd start off with the last post and the ode and all, you know, there's this proper sequence of events that's supposed to happen or it was all going to happen on our phones on our driveway. But the people up the street, uh, they were out there too. They had their boombox out and they were getting their recorded thing from somewhere else and it started 15 seconds early so we, we we're there counting down this is exciting it's exciting and then the last post started before we were ready uh, but it was great to be out on the street we had candles with sprigs of rosemary uh, just to remember Anzac Day it is an important thing uh, just to to acknowledge the great cost of um, our freedoms we should never, ever take it for granted. Well, another thing you can do when you're in isolation is to try and bless the rest of us. Uh, and I sent out in my letter on Thursday a bit of a shout out. Look, if you've got a, a skit or a testimony or something, you just record it and send it in and we can play it. Well, this, this week I've had one already and I think it's fantastic. It's the Pierce family. Uh, with a Bible verse for us. Uh, I'm going to play that now uh, and look, just look at it and go, you know what, we can do that kind of thing uh, and just record stuff, send it in and we'll see how we go. Here we go. Thanks to the Pierce family. Uh, I, I love the shot at the end. Oi, they're all gone in a hurry. That was fantastic. Well, this morning we are continuing in our studies in the book of Revelation and we're going to do the first chapter. Well, it's really the end of the first chapter. Uh, I'm going to read it first, then pray, and then uh, we'll get underway. Um, you will find uh, on our Facebook page in the images section a set of notes. So uh, they're, not, they're not that extensive. It really just covers one portion of the message and it has more information that, than what I'll be saying. So you might want to look at them. Okay. Here we go. John, to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne 
and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to his God and Father, to him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. I, John, your brother and partner in the tribulation and the kingdom and the patient endurance that are in Jesus, was on the island called Patmos, on account of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. I was in the spirit on the Lord's day and I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet saying, write what you see in a book and send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. Then I turned to see the voice that was speaking to me and on turning I saw seven golden lampstands and in the midst of the lampstands one like a son of man clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze refined in a furnace and his voice was like the roar um, of rushing waters. Um, yes. Yes, and in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword, and his face was like the, the sun shining in full strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead, but he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I'm the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and Hades. Write, therefore, the things that you've seen, those that are and those that are to take place after this. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches." Let me pray. Lord, we thank you for this great day. Thank you for your word. And I pray that you would reveal yourself, that everyone watching would have just a small taste of your great glory. May who you are captivate our hearts and our minds and fill our vision. Lord, we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Well, you know what they say, familiarity breeds contempt. And I'm afraid that for many Christians, we have this problem with Jesus. Jesus is called our friend. And I fear that sometimes in our attempts to know him and make him known, that we have simply reduced him to be one of us. Maybe a little bit better, but actually just a better version of ourselves. But I think it's crucial, and even in these difficult days, it's especially crucial to have our vision of Jesus just right. You see, who exactly is it that we are trusting for the future? Who exactly is it that we pray to? Who is it? that we are trusting for our personal salvation? Who do we consider actually rules the world? Who is this? You know, when Pauline and I were at Bible college, uh, we used to have the previous principal over for dinner once a week. And we learnt heaps from him. I always say I learnt more from him than I did from Bible college. Uh, we'd eat tea together and he would share what he was learning and bless us with Bible verses and so on. And I think, I think one day we were having a chat to him about uh, who we should pray to. Uh, should we pray to the Father like the Lord's Prayer says? 
Should we pray to the Lord Jesus, considering he is the Lord and every knee shall bow to him? Or is it okay to pray to the Spirit, all equally God, who should we pray to? And I think we were talking about that. And uh, Pauline asked him, well, you know, who is it? You know, if we are praying to Jesus, what should we imagine him to be like? Should we think of him as the carpenter's son walking around in Palestine? Should we think of him? Perhaps we should think of him as dying on the cross for us, like we do when we have communion. What? How should we think of him? And I'll never forget it. Uh, old Dr. Gibson, he uh, did this thing where he put his hands together like that, touched the end of his fingers. I've told the church folks about that before. And he rocked back in his chair and he just said, he's the sovereign of the universe. And that stuck with me ever since. When I pray, I'm praying to the sovereign of the universe. When we are thinking about how all this virus business and economic downturn is going to end, and we talk to Jesus about it, we're talking to the sovereign of the universe. The book of Revelation is an unveiling of the future, the future of the world and how it will end. But it's also an unveiling of Jesus Christ. Here is presented to us a picture of Jesus as he will be when he returns. And I think we'll, we'll do well to focus on how he is presented. It was a Sunday, I believe. Some doubt that, but it's good, I think. Uh, to be a Sunday. John is in the spirit. It's some kind of ecstatic experience and God reveals to John a great vision. It is the revelation of Jesus Christ. It is from Jesus. It is about Jesus and John is instructed clearly, write what you see in a book, send it to the seven churches, to Ephesus and to Smyrna and to Pergamum and to Thyatira and to Sardis and to Philadelphia and to Laodicea. John was shown a vision and he wrote a letter to the seven churches outlining the contents of what he saw. But I want you to understand as good Bible scholars we need to make it clear it's not just that the revelation from God was a revelatory vision and then John struggled to write down what he saw and send it to us. God was involved in the process of John writing as well just like he was when Paul was writing his letters, just like he was when Matthew, Mark and Luke and John were writing down their Gospels, just like it was when the prophet Isaiah was given messages to deliver and that was recorded for us. The words of the book of Revelation themselves are inspired by God, not just the vision that John received. Both are. And so as we study the book, we should take the words, not just as John the human's attempt to describe visions that he had difficulty describing, but we should take his descriptions as divine descriptions as well. And so today we're going to talk about who Jesus is, how he's presented in this chapter, what he was like and what uh, our response to him should be. And so we have, first of all, the heavenly Jesus. What was he like? The description of what John saw starts in verse 13. There it says, And in the midst of the Lamb stands one like a son of man, clothed with a long robe and with a golden sash around his chest. The hairs of his head were white, like white wool, like snow. His eyes were like a flame of fire. His feet were like burnished bronze, refined in a furnace. And his voice was like the roar of many waters. And in his right hand, he held seven stars. From his mouth came a sharp two-edged sword. And his face was like the sun shining in full strength. Well, there's several descriptions there and you'll find in the notes, if you can find them on the Facebook page, that uh, you've, uh, you've got more detail than what I'm going to say. 
But the first is he is the son of man. Jesus appeared as a human. As the son of man, he was a, a, a human. We mustn't forget that. He may have died and been brought back to life. He may have been there at the beginning as God. But ever since the first Christmas, Jesus has been a human. God and man together. His return to heaven at his ascension has in no way diminished his humanity. We must remember this point, but that title, Son of Man, there's more to it. And we'll come to talk about that in a minute. He has a robe and a sash. Jesus was dressed from head to foot and he had a sash around his chest, not the waist. I think uh, a bit like the beauty pageant type sash that goes over the shoulder and comes down. This outfit's just like the ones prescribed by God for the priests in Exodus. You shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. You shall speak to all the skillful whom are filled with the spirit of skill that they make Aaron's garments to consecrate him for my priesthood. These are the garments that they shall make, a breastpiece, an ephod, a robe, a coat of checker work, a turban and a sash. They shall make holy garments for Aaron, your brother and his sons to serve me as priests. And down to verse 40. For Aaron's sons, you shall make coats and sashes and caps. You shall make them for glory and beauty. Notice that for glory and for beauty. The priest's outfits had a purpose. John saw Jesus as a priest and his outfit was for beauty and for glory. Now, some of you uh, more mature listeners would be encouraged by the fact that Jesus has white hair. They reckon it's because he's old. Well, he is old, but I don't think that's the reason. I think he has white hair because verse 14 is clearly a picture of Daniel chapter 7. Let's have a look at that. As I looked, thrones were placed and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was white as snow and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was fiery flames and its wheels were burning fire. A stream of fire issued and came out from before him. A thousand thousand served him and 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court sat in judgment and the books were open. Now that's a vision of the ancient of days, but I want you to get the imagery. It sounds pretty similar. John's vision puts Jesus up there with God, but let's read on. I saw in the night visions and behold, with the clouds of heaven, there came one like a son of man. Ding a ling. Remember that. And he came to the ancient of days and was presented before him. And to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom one that shall not be destroyed. And so there we have the son of man. That's, I think, why Jesus called himself the son of man in the Gospels. And it's why he's presented as such here. It is a reference to uh, Daniel's great vision of the ancient of days. The white, I think, is a symbol of purity and judgment. This is on the throne type imagery. Uh, you know, in our judicial system, the judges wear funny white wigs and so on. We, we get this kind of imagery. It makes sense to us. That's the picture we should have of Jesus. Also, his eyes were like a flame of fire. It is a picture of piercing judgment. He sees and he sees straight through us. And the fact that he sees is enough to burn us. You know, he doesn't need to look at you and then act to punish. The act of looking is punishing of itself. Do you, do you get this point? People are being, who are being convicted of their sins by God know what this is like. And many Christians will testify to this. For many, it happens regularly. For some, there is, has been a time when there is 
God's or Jesus' eyes burn their souls and they need to put things right with him. His eyes of fire, flames, pierce your soul. Next, his feet are like bronze, burnished bronze. The altar upon which offerings for sin were to be made is a brazen altar, purified and shiny metal alloy. The tools used in sacrifices were also made of bronze. The glowing in the furnace is the purification of the fire that the the cultic bronze had to be put through. Again, I think this is a picture of purity in the judgment of sin. He's got a voice like the sound of many waters. You should be thinking like Niagara Falls, a deep, constant roar of awesome power. There'll be no answering back to this Jesus. There'll be no, oh, excuse me, you won't get a word in. Next, there's the seven stars in his hands. This seems strange, except that it's explained in verse 20. As for the mystery of the seven stars that you saw in my right hand and the seven golden lampstands, the seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. What are these angels of the seven churches? Well, the word angel can mean angel, but it can also simply mean messenger. And so some like to think, oh, isn't this nice? It's good to know that each church has its own angel, you know, the wing things. But it, it, uh, it's a mushy thought, but I want you to notice that these angels are addressed as the recipients of the letters. As you go through to the angel of the church in Ephesus, write the words of him who holds the seven stars in his right hand. Verse 8, and to the angel of the church in Smyrna, right? We could go and look at the address of each of the letters to the churches. They are addressed to the angels. And if you read the content of the messages, it's impossible that the letters are addressed to actual real angels. And so most people believe that the word angel here is referring to the leaders of the churches because of the failings in the letters that follow it doesn't seem right to have the angels being addressed as the failures. The fact that Jesus has these messengers in his hands is encouraging for church leaders, especially pastors. Someone once said, you know, the pastors get called a whole lot of different things. So it's nice for a change to have them called angels. Another thing I'd like to comment about is, uh, the seven spirits before the throne. Back in verse four, John to the seven churches in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who was and is and is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Some take these seven spirits to be angels. Angels, fallen or other eyes are called spirits all the way through the Bible. But it seems to me that it's a reference to Isaiah 11 that's referring to the Holy Spirit and doesn't mean that there are seven of the spirits, but it means there are seven facets to the one spirit. You'll have to look at Isaiah 11 to see, but you'll find there, uh, DJP will put it up for you for a sec, you'll find there seven characteristics of the spirit. And I think that's what's alluded to here. Next, we have the two-edged sword coming out of his mouth. This is a weapon. Uh, the language is of a long, long sword, not a short sword. Uh, it's scary. Jesus will be returning to slay the nations with just a word. And if seeing you isn't enough, if he speaks, you'll die. And finally, his face is like the sun. We could compare the many incidents in the scriptures where God is a bright light. Moses saw it, uh, but it's as bright as the sun, so bright that you can't even look at him. Uh, the glory of Christ is too much for human eyes. Uh, but it is great to know that one day we will be changed. And just as John saw, we'll be able to see him because we will be like him we will be changed and so we'll be able to see his glory. 
So how are you going? That's a lot of information and I've not even covered all of it, but you'll find some of it in the notes. I want us to talk about some of the things that he's done. It's in verses 5 to 7. And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead and the ruler of kings on earth, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priests to God and Father to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. Behold, he is coming with the clouds and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail or mourn on account of him. Even so. Amen. Well, there's a lot of stuff in there. Jesus is a witness. He points us to the truth of God. Faithful in the Bible means true or consistent. So Jesus truthfully and consistently is a witness to God. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. You deal with Jesus, you're dealing with God. That's why it's okay to pray to him. He's the firstborn from the dead. He is the first human to have died and to be raised into a new order of life, victorious over death. Not just resuscitated, but resurrected. That's really different. Never to die again. He is the ruler of the kings of the earth, even North Korea, even the United States, even the British Empire. All authority on heaven and earth are his. The Father has placed all things except himself under the feet of Jesus. And that includes you and I. It is anybody in the world, any world ruler, who may appear to be doing whatever they please. And so you may be worried about a virus now. You may be worried about the impending economic downturn. You might think think that those things have your future set. But think about who this Jesus is. He is way above all things. You shouldn't be fearing the virus. You shouldn't be trusting your future to the hand of a virus. You should be fearing Jesus instead and placing your destiny in his hands (laughs) because it actually is in his hands. So you should be trusting him and not some virus or some economic downturn. Then he loved us and he freed us from our sins by his blood. He died paying the penalty for our sins, so now we can be free. Free. That's a great word in these days of isolation. No longer stuck at home. No longer having to be uh, constricted. When Jesus' blood paid for our sins, we're set free. The guilt, the shame, we're free. It's a great word. All because Jesus has shed his blood. And he's made us as a kingdom. He reigns in and through us. We're supposed to be priests. We stand between the world and God. We're supposed to bring the two together. Every eye is going to see Jesus when he comes. Those who pierced him, I don't think is a reference to the Roman soldiers who were there at the first Easter. I think it's a reference to the prophet Zechariah, where there's a prophecy of Israel's restoration in chapter 12. DJP will put it up. He's going to pour out in the house of David and in the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. On that day, the mourning in Jerusalem will be as great as the mourning for Hadad Rimon in the plain of Megiddo. The land shall mourn each family by itself the family of the house of David by itself and their wives by themselves and the family of the house of Nathan by itself and their wives by themselves. So when Jesus appears, the people of Israel will mourn and you know, so will the whole earth. All the tribes of the earth will wail and mourn. Mourn for their own rejection of Jesus. Mourn because of their own personal sin. So this is a great picture of Jesus and what he's done. So how should we react? Well, it's not an easy thing to think that when he appears, the world will mourn, they'll wail. And I think it's no small thing 
that the Apostle John was probably Jesus' closest friend. No one knew Jesus better than the beloved disciple. John rested his head on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper. John was the one who was entrusted to care for Jesus' own mother, Mary, when Jesus was dying on the cross. And it's been some 60 years since, and John uh, has now found himself on a prison on an island, and he hasn't seen his close friend and saviour for all that time. You'd expect them, when they come together, to have a hug, to have a warm embrace. And all that John has been through for Jesus, I'd be expecting him to fall into Jesus' arms. But notice what happened. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. When I saw him, I fell at his feet, though dead. The world will mourn when it sees Jesus and Jesus' best friend, John, falls at his feet. And that's just a vision of Jesus. Imagine the real one. And we have the gall to just call him our friend. It rolls off the tongue. Familiarity breeds contempt. I am afraid that we've become so familiar with Jesus that we have him under our control. We've lost the sense of his holiness and judgment. We forgot those days when his eyes looked into our hearts and we burned with conviction. We would like to think that he'll give us a chance to defend ourselves, but he would destroy us with just a word. You know, some people so struggle this idea of Jesus being one to whom the whole world will mourn is just so foreign to some people they don't get it. But James saw it. Jesus' own brother, he knew. Look what he says in James 4. He says, draw near to God and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble you yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. See the end? Humble yourself and you'll be exalted. Look at what Jesus did for John. John, he fell at his feet as though dead. But he laid his right hand on me, saying, Fear not, I am the first and the last and the living one. I died and behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of death and Hades. So this great sovereign of the universe, Jesus, reached down, touched John with his right hand and lifted him up. Don't be afraid. I am the beginning and the end. I'm alive forevermore and I have the keys of death and hell. And in all that we have seen about Jesus, the proper response is to fall down before him. He is awesome and terrible. His glory is beyond description. His authority unchallengeable. And yet in our need, there's no one else to turn to but him. We fall at his feet and yet he lifts us up. You know, with our uncertain future, he is the beginning and the end. He knows how everything is going to end. We must face death, but he's died and conquered death once and for all. We fear what's beyond the grave, but he holds the keys to death and Hades. You know, he may be awesome and fearful, but he also beckons us to trust him. We have no one else to turn to. Yes, his eyes search our hearts. Yes, He stands in glory brighter than we can perceive, but he is our saviour and there is no other. This is the same Jesus who died for us and he wants to lift us up, but we must be honest before him. Better now than before he comes when you won't have the choice. That's a picture of Jesus. What a wonder, what an awesome person he is. 
He is the most wonderful person who has, who is, and who will ever be. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you have revealed this all to us. And I pray that as we look into the book of Revelation more, that we would not just be taken by the events of the future, but we would be taken by him who holds the future in his hands. And just as John's heart and mind was filled with a vision of the Lord Jesus, I pray that we will as well. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.